Now I have the pleasure of introducing tonight's speaker. Dr. Aaron Barth is on the faculty of the University of California, Irvine, one of the eight UC campuses that uses Lick Observatory. He's an observational astronomer whose research interests are focused on the structure and dynamics of galaxies, the detection of supermassive black holes in galaxy centers, and the properties of galactic, uh, active galactic nuclei and quasars. Dr. Aaron Barth. So, first of all, I just wanted to say it's great to see everybody tonight, and I'm glad you all were able to come up to Mount Hamilton tonight. It's going to be a beautiful night for viewing. And what I'm going to try to do over the next 45 minutes or so is tell you about a project that I've been working on over the last few years here at Lick Observatory to study supermassive black holes in galaxy centers along with my research group, postdoctoral researchers, graduate students, and undergraduates at UC Irvine, and collaborators from UC Santa Barbara, UC Riverside, UCLA, and UC Berkeley. It's a big team project that involved a, a lot of people, more than 30 people in the UC system have contributed to this project. Now, the basic idea of a black hole, to start with, is that a black hole is an object whose mass is so dense and so concentrated that nothing is, can escape from its gravitational pull. Not even light can escape from its gravitational pull. And the modern physical understanding of black holes and how they work comes from Einstein's general theory of relativity, which was published in 1915. But in fact, the first scientific idea of a black hole goes back much farther than that, over 200 years, in fact. The first published idea of something like a black hole comes from a British scientist named John Mitchell, in a letter that he wrote in 1784. John Mitchell was a brilliant guy, brilliant scientist. Um, he was one of the founders of seismology, and he was uh, uh, an expert in the study of Newtonian physics, that is, gravity and uh, classical mechanics, the theory that uh, Isaac Newton pioneered. And John Mitchell, in a letter in 1784, wrote something really, really remarkable and sort of forward-looking as a consequence of his understanding of Newton's theory of gravity. And what he wrote here, this is the best image I could find of it, and it's a little hard to see, but I'll read through the, the key parts of it. What he wrote in this letter, he was speculating on the properties of very massive objects. And he wrote, if there should really exist in nature any bodies whose density is not less than that of the sun, and whose diameters are more than 500 times the diameter of the sun, since their light could not arrive at us, we could have no information from sight. It's a sort of a remarkable statement for 1784. He's saying that according to, to the laws of physics as they were known at the time, it was possible to conceive of an object so massive that its gravitational pull would be so strong that even light could not escape from its surface. And he was basically right about that idea, although now with Einstein's theory of general relativity, we have a more specific idea of how, uh, how that would work. But then he goes on to say something even more remarkable, I think, which he says, yet if any other luminous bodies should happen to revolve about them, we might still perhaps from the motions of these revolving bodies infer the existence of the central ones with some degree of probability. So what he's saying is that if you had an object like a black hole, something that was so massive that it was tracking its own light, you couldn't see it. So how would you know that it's there? Well, if there's a star in orbit around it, and you can see a star moving in a circle around some, some blank spot in, in the sky, well, you know that there has to be something in the middle there that's pulling on the star gravitationally and making it go in a circle. And then if you've got really good measurements, you could even measure the mass of that dark thing in the middle. It's a fairly straightforward application of Newtonian mechanics, but it's a really remarkable statement that he was able to come up with this idea and think of an object that could be that massive that early on in history. And his basic idea of how we detect and study black holes is basically what we still do today. We look for objects orbiting around black holes and use the orbital motion of stuff orbiting around a black hole to detect the existence of a black hole and measure the mass of the black hole. How does that work in practice? Well, suppose you have a very massive object, like a supermassive black hole, maybe millions of times more massive than a single star like the sun, and you have a star that's in orbit around it, like that. So you can actually 
measure the mass of the black hole in a very specific way using simple Newtonian physics. There's some simple things that you could try to measure. For example, you could try to measure the speed of the orbit of the star around a much more massive black hole. And you could try to measure the radius of the orbit. And those two quantities, the speed and the radius, are connected to the mass of the very massive central object in a really simple way. Normally, in a talk like this, it's best to avoid showing any equations or any mathematics whatsoever. But I'm going to show one simple equation in this talk just to show you how simple the situation actually is in Newtonian physics. The mass, the speed, and the radius are related just by the simple equation. You take the radius, you multiply it by the velocity squared, that is the speed of the orbit, and divide by Newton's constant g. That's a constant of nature, and it's just a number that describes the strength of the gravitational force in nature. Just take that simple ratio, and that gives you the mass of the very massive thing in the center. It's really just that simple. And that's the basic method that we still use in a lot of different situations to try to measure masses in astronomy. We can measure masses by the same basic technique, to measure masses of stars, to measure masses of planets by looking at the orbits of moons going around planets, and we can use the same technique to measure the masses of black holes if we can find something in orbit around the black hole. Now, what if this system that you see here was so far away that you couldn't actually see the orbital motion of that object on the sky? If that, if that star in orbit around the black hole was so far away that you couldn't see it making that little circle in the sky, how could you determine the speed of that orbit? Well, in fact, there's a way that you can do that using the Doppler shift. And you may be familiar with the idea of the Doppler shift of sound. For example, if there's a police car or an ambulance coming towards you and you're listening to the siren, you'll hear the siren have a higher pitch when it's coming towards you, and then it passes by and goes away from you, and you'll hear the pitch shift to a lower pitch as it's going away. That's an example of the Doppler shift for sound. And the Doppler shift for light works in a similar way. So suppose you have something like a fluorescent light bulb. In a fluorescent light bulb, most of the light from that light bulb is coming out because you have specific elements like mercury in a vapor in that tube. And when that vapor is excited by an electric current passing through it, electrons in those mercury atoms get kicked up to higher energy levels by the electric current, and they fall back down to lower energy levels. And when they fall back down to lower energy levels, they emit a photon of light. And that photon of light comes out at a very, very specific wavelength that depends on those energy levels in the mercury atom or whatever other atoms are in that bulb. So if you make a plot of the spectrum of light, by the spectrum of light, I mean a plot of the amount of energy coming out as a function of wavelength from a bulb like this, what you would see are specific spectral lines, that is, peaks, where you have a lot of energy coming out at one very, very specific wavelength. So when you spread the light out into its constituent wavelengths, going from blue to red, for a bulb like that, you would see certain peaks at very, very specific wavelengths, very sharp peaks in the spectrum. Now, if the light bulb is at rest relative to you, if the light bulb is just sitting there, then that's the spectrum that you might observe, and that defines what's called the rest wavelength of the spectral line. That's the wavelength that you observe when the bulb is just sitting there, not moving relative to you. But the way the Doppler shift works is, suppose the bulb is moving towards you at some speed. When the bulb is moving towards you, the wavelengths of light get scrunched together, and what you observe is a spectrum that's shifted down to bluer wavelengths. The wavelengths get shifted, and that's something you can measure very straightforwardly with instruments like what we have here at the Shane Telescope at Lick Observatory. We can measure the amount of that blue shift, and from the blue shift relative to the rest wavelength that we already knew, we can tell how fast that bulb is moving towards us. The faster the bulb is moving towards us, the bigger the shift of the spectral line. And conversely, if the bulb is moving away from us, we see what's called a red shift. The wavelengths of light get stretched out to longer wavelengths, and we would see, instead of the light coming out at its rest wavelength, we would see the spectral line coming out at a longer, redder wavelength. So with a, an instrument like a spectrograph, like what we have here at the observatory, we can measure wavelengths of spectral lines and use the wavelengths of the lines that we measure to determine the speed that objects are moving towards us or away from us. 
We can learn about the state of motion of objects in orbit that way. Now, back to the story of black holes. In the early 1960s, um, astronomers discovered a new class of object that wasn't known or even really suspected to exist before. And this was a, a kind of object called a quasar. And these quasars were really amazing objects, far different from anything that was known about stars or any other kind of celestial object before then. These quasars were distant, point-like sources of light on the sky that were far more distant than the galaxies that were known at the time. But these quasars, despite their enormous distances from us, were remarkably bright in the sky. And if you have something that's at a huge distance, but it appears fairly bright in the sky, that means that it must be radiating a tremendous amount of energy. And in fact, the brightest quasars can be hundreds or even thousands of times more luminous than an entire galaxy of hundreds of billions of stars. This object in the middle of this picture here is a quasar called 3C273, and that was the first quasar that was ever really identified. It's roughly about two billion light years away from us, and yet it appears in the sky as bright as a, about a 13th magnitude star. Quasars like this are amazingly powerful sources of energy. They can be extremely distant from us, and they're extremely powerful sources of x-rays, of radio waves, of other kinds of electromagnetic en energy, <coughs> in addition to the visible light that you can see with visible wavelength telescopes, like what we have here at Lake Observatory. Now, after the discovery of quasars, it became clear in the 1960s pretty quickly to astrophysicists that there was one best probable explanation for the enormous amount of energy coming out of quasars like this, and that was that they had to be, and this sounds like a little bit of a strange explanation, but in fact, this is by far the simplest explanation for what a quasar could be. A quasar is a supermassive black hole, that is, a black hole with a mass of many millions or even up to billions of times the mass of the sun, and that black hole is swallowing up gas at a furious rate possibly up to 10 or 20 or even more times the mass of the sun worth of gas falling into the black hole every year. And that releases a tremendous amount of energy because if you take a cloud of gas and you run it past a black hole, it can get captured into orbit around the black hole and the gas as it spirals down toward the black hole heats up tremendously. Eventually it will fall into the black hole and disappear and we won't see it anymore. But as that gas is falling toward the black hole, it gets very hot, it becomes very luminous, and it's a tremendous source of electromagnetic radiation, x-rays, ultraviolet light, visible wavelength light, radio waves, that we can observe with a variety of different kinds of telescopes. <coughs> and in fact, there's no other mechanism known that is even a really plausible explanation for the enormous amount of energy coming out of quasars. Ordinary chemical burning can't give you anywhere near the amount of energy. Nuclear fusion can't give you this amount of energy from a reasonable amount of fuel. But if you drop a large amount of gas into a black hole, you can get tremendous amounts of energy out in the form of light and x-rays. Now, at this point, th this was the first quasar that was really identified, and we're seeing light that left that quasar about two billion years ago. We now know of quasars that are much more distant than that. We now know of quasars that are so distant that we're seeing the light that left those quasars when the universe was less than a billion years old. And so quasars like that, very distant quasars, since we can see them at such large distances, they're enormously powerful lighthouses that we can use to study the properties of the universe when the universe was very young. And so they're very, very important in astronomy. And we want to understand as much as we can about the physical conditions in the quasars themselves and also about the masses of the black holes that are really the central powerhouses of these quasars. Now, after quasars were discovered, it was suspected pretty strongly that the giant black holes in quasars would be located at the centers of galaxies, galaxies like the Milky Way. And in fact, there was a lot of evidence supporting this, and then finally it was really proved beyond any shadow of a doubt with observations from the Hubble Space Telescope. So these are observations with one of the early generation cameras from the Hubble Space Telescope of several quasars, and the quasar is the bright point in the middle of each picture, and what you can see is that the quasar is this enormously bright point of light in the very center of a galaxy, like that. There's a spiral galaxy kind of like the Milky Way, 
That one's an elliptical galaxy. And some of them are very messed up galaxies that are involved in mergers or interactions with other galaxies. What can happen there is that during a merger between two galaxies, these mergers are gravitationally very violent, disruptive events. And the merger between two galaxies can channel a lot of gas down to the center of each of the galaxies where the black holes are and fuel the growth of the black holes by fueling accretion of gas onto the quasars. So you may have a dormant black hole for a long time, but in a violent merger between galaxies like this, if you send a lot of gas down to the neighborhood of the center of the galaxy where the black hole is, the black hole can start swallowing up the gas. It'll turn on brightly as a quasar, maybe for about 100 million years. We don't really know how long a typical episode of this quasar activity lasts, but probably for a pretty long time. And during that time, as the quasar is swallowing up this gas, the, the, the black hole gets more massive and bigger over time. This is how black holes grow. Now, since we know that quasars live in the centers of galaxies like this, we have every reason to think that when we look at normal quiet galaxies, like this giant elliptical galaxy that doesn't have any quasar-like activity at its center, that galaxies like this probably once hosted a luminous quasar right at its very center, and that as a remnant of that past quasar activity, there's probably a dormant, sort of sleeping, quiet black hole right at the center of that galaxy. So we have good reason to suspect that that might be the case, but how would you find a black hole in the center of a galaxy like that? If the black hole is not swallowing up any gas, then it's totally quiet and you can't see it. It's just black. Light can't escape from it. Well, in principle, if you had a powerful enough telescope, you could do John Mitchell's trick that John Mitchell suggested and with a powerful enough telescope in principle, what you could try to do is zoom in on the very central region of that galaxy, zoom in as closely as you could, and look for stars that are in orbit around the very center of the galaxy. And by studying the speed and the distance of the orbit, you could essentially weigh the very center of the galaxy and see if there is a very massive object right there at the center, which you might need to explain very, very rapid, fast orbits of stars at the center of a galaxy like that. But in fact, we can't do that measurement directly for galaxies like this, because we don't have any telescopes that can zoom in anywhere near close enough on the center of a galaxy like that. For every other galaxy that we look at in the universe outside of our own galaxy, if you look at the center of the galaxy, all you see is the blur of millions upon millions of stars tightly packed in close together, and it's completely impossible to pick out any one star that might be in an interesting orbit around the black hole. The only case where you can actually try to detect a black hole by that particular trick of looking at the orbits of individual stars is our own Milky Way galaxy that we live in, because we're fairly close to the center of our own Milky Way galaxy, where we are sort of out in the outskirts in a spiral arm of the Milky Way, about roughly 25,000 light years from the center of the Milky Way. But that's pretty close by cosmic standards. And in fact, uh, astronomers have been able to study the black hole in the center of the Milky Way in tremendous detail by doing that trick of looking at the orbits of objects that are orbiting around the black hole. And this comes from years and years of beautiful, painstaking work done by the UCLA group, led by Professor Andrea Ghez at UCLA, using the Keck telescope and the very powerful adaptive optics system at the Keck Observatory. What they've done is, for something like 15 years now, they've taken pictures, very, very sharp, high-resolution pictures, at the center of the Milky Way galaxy every year, as many times as they can over the observing season, spread over months during the year. And they watch the stars move from month to month, from year to year, the stars are moving very fast. Some of the stars in the center of the Milky Way galaxy are zipping around at speeds of over a thousand kilometers per second. And they're zipping around that fast because there's a very, very massive object right there, a massive invisible object that's not giving off any light, but there's a ma massive object that's pulling on them gravitationally. And what they've found after years and years of this painstaking work is that these stars are all in orbit around a common sort of center. There's one central position, and all of these stars are in these orbits looping around that position, and that's the position at the very center of our galaxy where the black hole is. Now, you don't really see anything there. The black hole isn't doing anything. 
Once in a while, it swallows a little parcel of gas and sort of burps a little bit, and it gives off a little bit of infrared light or a little bit of x-rays. But in general, it's not very bright. So you could look at it and not see anything at all. But from the orbits of these stars, they've determined that the mass of the black hole there, which is largely invisible, is about 4 million times greater than the mass of our sun. So there's an incredibly massive, yet almost completely invisible object right there at the center of the Milky Way. And we'd like to learn more about black holes in other galaxies, but other galaxies are so much more distant from us that we can't do anything like this kind of precision measurement for any other galaxy. <coughs> when we look at any other galaxy in the universe, like this spiral galaxy here, what we see is just, the, in the central region, it's just the blur of the light of millions of stars together. We can't pick out individual stars. This is a spiral galaxy where you can see, for example, the, the flat disk component of the spiral galaxy with the spiral arms. There's a bar, this is what's called a barred spiral. And in the central region, there's a sort of a spherical region here that's called the spheroid, or sometimes it's called the central bulge. And astronomers have developed methods, especially using the Hubble Space Telescope, to study not the orbits of individual stars in that central bulge, but sort of the aggregate motions of the entire population of stars in the bulge of galaxies like that, and use that to get uh, less precise but still very good measurement of the mass of the central black hole in galaxies like that. And those kinds of measurements, mostly with the Hubble Space Telescope, have now been done for a few dozen galaxies. And one of the important results that's been found over the last 10 to 15 years or so is that bigger galaxies have bigger black holes. It turns out that the mass of the black hole in a galaxy is roughly speaking proportional to the mass of that bulge component, of, of the mass of all the stars in that central sphe spheroid or bulge component in the host galaxy. So this is a compilation of measurements done of many, uh, many black holes in nearby galaxies. And what's found is that the black holes in nearby galaxies have masses that range anywhere from a few million times the mass of the sun up to a few billion times the mass of the sun and they're roughly proportional to the mass of the bulge component of the host galaxy. And even though a massive black hole with a mass of billions of times the mass of the sun seems like a really huge object, it's really, it's just a tiny speck compared with the mass of the whole galaxy that it lives in. It turns out that the mass of the black hole in a galaxy is typically about one-tenth of one percent of the mass of that central bulge component of the host galaxy that it lives in. So the black hole in itself is not a very massive, it's not a, it's not a very important constituent of the total mass of the galaxy. But because these black holes can release so much energy when they're in an active quasar phase, swallowing up lots of gas, black holes are actually very important in sort of the life cycles of galaxies and in determining how much gas in galaxies gets converted into stars over the lifetime of a galaxy. Now, what about black hole masses in quasars? How can we come up with an estimate of the mass of a black hole in a quasar? When we look at a quasar, typically it's much, much more distant than the galaxies like this, where we can do these measurements with the Hubble Space Telescope of the motions of stars in the central region to come up with a measurement of the mass of the black hole. And when you have a quasar, when you have an active black hole swallowing up lots of stuff, the quasar is so bright that typically it overwhelms the light of the entire galaxy and you can't even see the stars in the galaxy. All you see really is the light of the quasar unless you try very, very hard. So we would like to have at least approximate methods to determine or at least estimate the mass of the black hole in the quasar. And now I want to explain to you how we do this because this has to do with the measurement that we've been trying to do over the last few years here at Lake Observatory. So I'll, I'll try to explain how that works. And to do that, I'll have to explain a little bit about the properties of quasars. So when you look at a quasar, this is a simple cartoon of the anatomy of the central region of a quasar. This is a region that is so tiny in the central part of a galaxy that we have no hope of ever really taking a direct picture of it and seeing its structure in a direct picture. We can't do that. but by a whole series of different kinds of observations, we can surmise pretty well what the structure of the central region around the quasar looks like. And we're trying to learn more about it. So in the very center, you have a black hole. 
And surrounding the black hole, you have what's called an accretion disk. This is a disk of gas, mostly hydrogen gas, that is in orbit around the black hole and spiraling down toward the black hole. And as it spirals down toward the black hole, the gas gets incredibly hot. It radiates away a tremendous amount of energy. And that's the source of power of quasars. That's why quasars are so luminous. And surrounding all of that, because central regions of galaxies typically have a lot of gas and gas clouds floating around in different ways, what you typically have is a region of clouds of gas that are in orbit around the black hole, outside the accretion disks, at somewhat farther distances from the black hole. And those clouds are moving around at orbital speeds of thousands of kilometers per second around the black hole. Very, very fast. I'll tell you a little bit more about how we know what those speeds are in just a minute. But just to get a sense of scale here, the size of the accretion disk, you can think of as being sort of roughly comparable to or somewhat bigger than the size of our own solar system that we live in. The size of all of the orbits of all the planets out to Pluto would fit into, say, part of that accretion disk. So that's just to give you a sort of a sense of scale. So on the scale of an entire galaxy, this is a tiny, tiny, tiny object. And yet, the amount of energy released by this accretion disk as it's spiraling down toward the black hole can be more than the entire galaxy of stars, of hundreds of billions of stars uh, in the, that, are, that this quasar lives in. Now, to explain more about this measurement that we've been doing here at Lick, I need to tell you what the spectrum of light from a quasar looks like. So again, when I talk about the spectrum of light, what I mean is using something like a prism or a diffraction grating to spread the light out from a quasar into its constituent colors. That is, spread the light out as a function of wavelength so that we're looking at how much energy is coming out of the quasar as a function of the wavelength of light. And the wavelengths here run from blue to red. This is basically the range of wavelengths that you were able to see with your own eye. In, in numerical terms, it's roughly about 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers for those of you know what nanometers are. But in any case, this is, uh, this is what we see when we do a measurement with a telescope, like the, the Shane 120-inch telescope, of the spectrum of light. And what you see here is a couple of important features in the spectrum of light. And I'll explain to you what's going on here. What we see, first of all, is there's something called the continuum. And that just means continuous radiation. We see light, or energy, coming out at all wavelengths. And that energy is coming from the hot surface of the accretion disk. You can think of this accretion disk as being sort of white hot as the gas is spiraling down toward the black hole and glowing at a very high temperature. And when it glows, it glows at all wavelengths across the visible spectrum of light. So you're seeing light at all wavelengths from that surface of the accretion disk. But then you're also seeing these bumps in the spectrum, these spectral features. And these are spectral lines at specific wavelengths that come from specific atoms or uh, ions. For example, in a spectrum like this, an astronomer can tell you that this spectral line and that one and that one come from hydrogen atoms that are in those clouds surrounding the quasar that are lit up by the light coming from the, the accretion disk. There are other lines that come from oxygen. Some of these other lines come from sulfur or iron or helium. There's a whole variety of lines. And what's happening is that if I go back to this picture of the quasar, what's happening is the central part of the accretion disk is a tremendous source of ultraviolet light, x-rays, and all of that light is coming out and bombarding the gas in these clouds out here. And those clouds then, because they're illuminated by ultraviolet light and x-rays, those clouds then give off light in spectral lines that come from elements. And that light comes out at very, very specific wavelengths, like what we see here. Hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, neon, various elements that happen to be in those clouds orbiting around the black hole. Now, the next thing that you might notice, if you're looking carefully, is that some of these spectral lines are really fat. They're very broad in wavelength, and other ones are fairly narrow. Why is that? Well, now I have to go back to the Doppler shift, to my picture of the Doppler shift again. Intrinsically, any spectral line from a single element, on its own, if you have a light source that's at rest, the spectral line will be very, very narrow. Because a spectral line, say, from mercury or hydrogen or nitrogen from some specific element 
is at a very, very specific wavelength. So the energy comes out in a very, very narrow range of wavelengths. That's if the light source is at rest. But remember, if the light source is moving towards you, the wavelength that you observe will be shifted that way. If the light source is moving away from you, the wavelength that you observe will be shifted that way. So what happens now if you have not one light source, but say millions of light sources all orbiting around a central massive object, some of them are moving towards you very fast, some of them are moving away from you very fast, some of them are moving in different directions and they're not really moving towards you or away from you at that moment. What you get is a whole mix of wavelengths of light, some of which are blue shifted, some of which are red shifted. All of those bulbs, since they're made of the same stuff, are giving off light with the same spectral line, but some of them are giving off light that you see as blue shifted, some of them are giving off light that you see as red shifted, and all of those different blue shifted and red shifted light sources, each one of which is giving off a little bit of light, they combine to give you a very broad spectral line. So there's some light there that's red shifted, some light that's blue shifted, and a lot of light that's really neither red shifted nor blue shifted, just because of the state of motion of this whole system of clouds that are all moving around kind of randomly in this situation. So the width of the spectral line here is actually a measure of the aggregate speed of this whole swarm of light sources all in one around the black hole in this case. So when we look at the spectrum of light from a quasar like this, we see that some lines are very broad. Those are spectral lines coming from the clouds that are close to the black hole, so close that they're orbiting around the black hole at speeds of thousands of kilometers per second. And we can measure the widths of these lines very accurately and they tell us the average speed at which these clouds are orbiting around the black hole. In this case, again, as I said, these speeds correspond to thousands of kilometers per second. That's like going from here to New York in one second. That's how fast these clouds are zipping around the black hole. These particular lines, for example, uh, these broad lines are lines that are commonly seen in a lot of astronomical sources. This one is called the hydrogen alpha line. This one here is called the hydrogen beta line, and that's a very important one the kind of measurement that I'm going to tell you about. So now what we have is a system of clouds that are all orbiting around a black hole at very high speeds, and we have a way to measure sort of the aggregate or average speed that those clouds are moving. Now if we go back to John Mitchell's idea of how to get the mass of the thing in the middle, we have at least a rough average idea of the speeds that these things or light sources are moving around the black hole. But we don't know how far they are from the black hole. If we know the speed and we know the distance that these sources are on average from the black hole, we can get at least a rough estimate of the mass of the massive thing in the center. It's not going to be an accurate measurement in the same way that astronomers can do, say, for the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. It's more of a, a, a sort of a good estimate. But for a quasar, it's the best estimate that we can get, and it's very important because it lets us at least roughly estimate the black hole masses in very, very distant quasars, very, very far back in the history of the universe that are very interesting and important to study. So now the question is, if we know roughly the speed that those clouds are orbiting around the black hole, how do we know the distance between the black hole and where those clouds are that are emitting that spectral line? This whole object is so far away and so tiny that you can't just take a picture of it and measure its size. There's no direct way that you can measure the size of the system of clouds that are giving off that spectral line. But there's a way to do it, and that's now the, the measurement that I want to describe to you. It's called reverberation mapping or echo mapping, and it's a way to study the size and the structure and even the motions of clouds in this region very, very close to the black hole. Here's the sort of cartoon view, and then I'll show you what the real data looks like. The cartoon view is like this. Suppose you have a black hole and an accretion disk there that's a very powerful source of light, and suppose in a very simple cartoonish situation, you just had a spherical shell of gas around that, and you have continuum light at all wavelengths coming from that central engine, and then you have spectral lines coming from a shell of gas at some distance from the black hole. Now let's say that accretion disk is shining steadily, just at a constant brightness over time, and then it suddenly doubles its brightness because more gas starts piling into the black hole. Well, what's going to happen? Well, when that central source doubles in brightness, that signal of that extra brightness is going to travel outward at the speed of light. 
And at the speed of light, that signal will then approach that shell of gas clouds. And all of those gas clouds then will brighten as well. Those gas clouds in that shell are emitting the spectral lines. And when those gas clouds start getting bombarded with twice the amount of ultraviolet light and x-rays, then the spectral lines from that shell of clouds will double in brightness too, or at least roughly double. Now, what do you see when you're down here in the observatory looking at this whole thing? Well, the signal from that entire system propagates down towards you at the speed of light. So, when the central engine increases its brightness, that signal propagates towards you. But that signal also propagated in this direction and in this direction and caused that shell to increase in brightness. So what you're going to see is the central source will increase in brightness, but because the speed of light is not infinite, it takes a while for light, for light to travel from here to here and then back down to here, it's going to take a while for the light to get up to where that shell is and then for the light from that shell to then travel back down towards you. That's why this is called sort of echo mapping or reverberation mapping. You're essentially seeing an echo of the light from the central source echoing off of gas that's more distant from the black hole. So again, in cartoon form, what is it that we try to measure here? The basic idea is that if you measure the light curve, that is the brightness as a function of time, measure the brightness over time of the continuum source and of the spectral lines or emission lines coming from that shell, you might see schematically something like this. If the continuum source brightened suddenly, you would see the emission lines respond by brightening, but the emission lines would not brighten suddenly and instantaneously, because from your point of view down here, some of that signal had to then propagate out to the distant parts of the shell, and then the response signal had to propagate down towards you. So there's a delay time, an echo, in the signal that you see in the spectral lines that come from this more distant shell of gas. And since we know the speed of light, if you can measure the amount of time delay, that is the average time delay between when that change happened and when you see the response, since you know the speed of light, you can turn that time delay measurement into a measurement of the distance between the black hole and that shell of gas. So using the speed of light and listening for the echo, as it were, we can measure the size of the region that's giving us the spectral lines. That's the basic idea. Now, before 2008, measurements like this had been done for a few dozen galaxies. And um, it was a very important kind of measurement. There's a lot of research on black holes that's based on the results that comes up, come out of these measurements. It's because you need to follow the light curves for a long time and wait for some changes to happen in the light curve and then wait for the response time as well. So you might need months of continuous data every night for months. And so until a few years ago, nobody had ever tried to do a project like this on a telescope as big as the Shane 120 inch telescope. We decided to give it a try. And so my colleagues and I put together a project and we asked, we, we put in a request for more than two months of continuous telescope time at the Shane telescope here at the observatory. And we were granted the time. So in 2008, we got 64 nights in the spring of 2008 to do a project like this using the Shane 120-inch telescope and also getting supporting data from other excuse me, smaller telescopes like the 0.8-meter Katzman Automated Imaging Telescope, a small robotic telescope here at the observatory. And our strategy was to study nearby galaxies that are relatively nearby but have bright quasar-like nuclei because for these bright nearby versions of quasars, we can get great data here at Lick Observatory. We can study them in a lot of detail, and we can use the results to better develop the methods that astronomers use to study much more distant black holes where we can't study them in nearly as much detail. So, starting in late March 2008, we took over the Shane telescope, and we observed our sample of galaxies basically over and over and over and over again for 64 nights, every clear night. We, we lost some time because of bad weather and clouds and a fire in the Santa Cruz Mountains that was blowing ash over, all kinds of things happened. But basically, this is the result of one night's work at the Shane Telescope. These are the spectra that we measured for the 13 galaxies that we were studying. And the idea is that the continuum light is changing. It's getting brighter and fainter randomly over time in every object because the rate of gas piling onto the black hole is always fluctuating. It's not constant. And then 
the broad spectral lines respond with a delay time to the changes in the brightness of that continuum of light. So the whole idea is just to, to get these observations night after night after night until it gets really boring and then see what we get. We also got imaging data from small mm -hmm. telescopes like the Cape Telescope in order to measure the continuum changes more accurately. So these are images that come from the, the robotic Cape Telescope here at Lincoln Observatory. And here's an example of what some of the actual light curves look like. These are light curves, that is the brightness over time for two of the objects that we studied in two filter bands, a filter that isolated blue light and a filter that isolated the green continuum light. And what we did is we started observing and tried to get data every single night from February through June of 2008. And that line represents the date when we started then observing to get the spectroscopic data at the, at the Shane 120 inch telescope. And what you see is that these objects fluctuate in brightness just randomly over time. There's no way to predict what the black hole is going to do from one night to the next, just because of fluctuations in the accretion disk and the rate of matter piling onto the black hole. They change over time randomly. And we can actually see the spectral lines respond to that. So here's an example of two spectra for one object. Data taken on April 3rd, 2008, and then on May 4th. And you can see that spectral line changed pretty dramatically in brightness over the course of about a month. And if we look at the light curve of the continuum light and the light curve of the hydrogen beta line, emission line light, you can see that they're following basically the same pattern. That is, when the continuum light goes up, the spectral line goes up in response to it. But if I line these two <coughs> light curves up, and this is really the trick, you can see that the, the two light curves have basically the same shape, but there's a little bit of a time delay. As I described before, there's an echo uh, uh, and that echo gives you a time delay, and that echo, in this case, is a time delay of about four days. In other words, it takes light four days to travel from the central part of the accretion disk out to where those clouds are that are giving us the spectral lines. So the size of that region is about four light days. Now, that's very tiny compared to the size of the whole galaxy, but it's big, say, compared to the size of our solar system. And now, the final part of this is then going back to John Mitchell's trick, combining the measurement of the width of the spectral line, which tells us something about the orbital velocities, with the measurement of the radius at which those clouds are from the black hole, we get an estimate, sort of a rough estimate, but still a very useful one, of about 7 million solar masses for the mass of the black hole in this galaxy. And for galaxies like this, this is really the only method that we have to get even a good rough estimate the mass of the black hole. So we were able in 2008 to get good measurements like this for nine of the 13 galaxies that we were observing. And it was a very successful and fun project. And we decided to uh, go farther this year. We thought that based on what we learned from 2008, we could do even better this year. So we put in another proposal to follow up on this this year with a new sample of about 15 galaxies. These are, again, nearby galaxies that have bright quasar-like nuclei. You can see the bright point in the center of each one of these galaxies. And again, monitor them night after night after night in the spring. And so we got uh, an allocation of 70 nights on the Shane Telescope this spring, starting March 24th and going until June 12th with some gaps in the middle. Now some of you might remember that we had less than ideal observing weather this spring. Um, anyone who Seem, you might remember that there were a lot of storms, we had a lot of clouds, we had a lot of stormy weather. It wasn't a great year for observing here at Lake, at least in the spring, in, uh, in April and May, but we still managed to do pretty well. And here are some of, th this is still work in progress. I'm uh, working through the measurements of the spectroscopic data, and other members of our team are working through other parts of the data. And here are some of the light curves that we've measured for the hydrogen beta spectral line in some of the objects, showing these sort of random changes in brightness over time of the hydrogen beta spectral line that's happening in response to that, that echo of what the, the central continuum light is doing. So we think we're going to get some really nice measurements out of this eventually when we work through all the data. It's still a work in progress. I can just show you one sort of initial result that we're very happy about. This is a galaxy called Markarian 50. It's a nearby elliptical galaxy that has a, a bright quasar-like nucleus. And here, 
we managed to measure pretty good light curves for the continuum and for the hydrogen beta spectral line. You can see there are gaps in the light curve when we had big storms coming through where we couldn't get any data for a week or so. But again, you can see that the spectral line follows the same basic pattern as what the continuum is doing. But in this case, there's a lag or a time delay, an echo time delay, of about 11 and a half days. And this gives us, for this object, a rough estimate of the mass of the black hole of about 28 million solar masses in this case. And ultimately, what we want to do is to use these measurements to really develop and improve the methods that astronomers use to estimate the masses of black holes in very distant quasars so that we can use these methods to learn about the entire history of how black holes built up their enormous masses, starting from sort of small seed black holes in the early universe and growing to the enormous masses that we see today. Now, I'm just about out of time here, so I think I'm going to have to just go right to the end. And I hope this is giving you some flavor of the kind of work that we're doing here at Lick Observatory to study black holes. And I want to thank you all for coming. Please enjoy the views tonight through the telescopes. This is a very special opportunity, and you're going to have a beautiful night here. And uh, at this point, I'll be happy to try to answer any questions that you have.